that introduction. Soaked in mud, on the floor outside the overflowing loo of a Soviet-era train through rural Hungary, I sat, cramped among hundreds of Syrian, Afghan, Iraqi, and other refugees that this train was re-railed to carry. Squatting on this fetid patch of floor, petrified, being serenaded with Afghan folk song to calm my nerves, was one of the most sublime moments of my life. This word, sublime, that apex of sensation, <coughs> induced by my fear and simultaneous ecstasy, my relief and exhaustion, always reminds me of Canford when Dr. Kennedy suggested I acquaint myself with Edmund Burke's 1757 essay, 
a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful for my A-level English coursework. In a comparable opposition to Burke's treatment of beauty and sublimity, which stand on foundations so different that it is hard to think of reconciling them in the same subject, Canford's wisteria-lined stately grandeur and the wet, rubbish-strewn ground of a refugee camp in the Balkans might seem similarly incompatible. So how did an old Canfordian, three months out of Cambridge, come to travel from the Greek island of Lesbos along the Western Balkans route <coughs> to Germany as a refugee? It was around my time at Canford that I began to develop a conscious and progressively more acute awareness of the degree of privilege in which, fortuitously, I lived and of the imbalance between the life bestowed upon me by the mere circumstances of my birth and upon other people by theirs. No merit, no fault. As this awareness grew, so did the desire, or rather need, to use the resources that chance had gifted me to help rectify this inequality. And so it was that a volunteering trip to Lesbos quickly transformed itself into a muddy, legally dubious trek across the Balkans in the guise of a Syrian refugee. What prompted this unusual progression? Finding the reality of the, on the ground in Lesbos and the people I was meeting. Kind, intelligent, ambitious, heartbroken, confused normal, grateful people, in staggering contrast to the sensational pictures so elaborately painted in my mind by the mainstream media, I became frustrated at this disparity and at its impact on public reaction to the crisis and its victims. Even the overuse of the term crisis, especially in combination with European, proliferated the idea that it was us Europeans who were undergoing gargantuan suffering and dying at sea day by day. And by extension, that it was the people looking for safety from war and terrorism who were inflicting these things upon us and causing this deeply inconvenient crisis. How inconsiderate of them. The number-centric narratives and clinical statistics of the press reduced people to percentages and faces to figures. And the divisive rhetoric of swarms, floods and influxes transformed the people I was talking, laughing and crying with every day into a malignant, unintelligible alien species to be viewed with suspicion, if not fear. Knowing that each of these people <coughs> could be me, or my mother, or my best friend, had the accidents of our birth differently dispersed us geographically, and with a deep belief in the equal value of every human life, I determined to challenge this toxic narrative and to recenter the focus of the discussion on the individual human experience. I wanted to disprove the projected them-us binary by transgressing it, by putting myself in the position of the other from a Western viewpoint. I wanted to be that subject in which these two such different experiences became reconciled. So I invited myself to join a family as they made their way northwards towards Denmark. And I started a blog, I am a refugee, to share the details of my personal experience of this journey, as unique to me as each person's to them. The journey through Greece, Macedonia, <coughs> Serbia, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, and finally Germany was physically arduous, yes. We traveled through many a sleepless night, the October temperature was dropping fast and it rained solidly. Crossing from Macedonia to Serbia in the middle of a torrentially wet night, we came up against a waist-deep <coughs> river we had no choice but to wade through, 
children and all. But even conceding these corporeal trials, by far the greatest challenges I faced were psychological. Transported across a continent like a burdensome cargo of cattle, not quite good enough for market. No one ever thought to let us know where we were, how long we might stay there, or where we would be going next. Of course, the emotional struggles I encountered pale into oblivion next to those of the people I was traveling with. I wasn't coming from a background of profound trauma. I hadn't left everything familiar to me, including family and friends. I hadn't been traveling in dire conditions and at high risk for weeks already. And perhaps most importantly, I could end it whenever I wanted. I knew what the end looked like for me. The whole way, I carried the keys to my flat and an EU passport. That little bunch of papers that defines a human's right to safety, dignity, and protection. Had the border guards, police officers, functionaries, and even volunteers I encountered known that I was carrying this, the treatment I would have received from them would have been starkly different. My initiation to the world of being seen as a refugee, just one more anonymous face in the crowd devoid of identity and importance, was on the ferry from Lesbos to the mainland. Woken by shouting and aggressive pulling and prodding from members of the ferry staff at several points in the night, on one occasion, one man yanked my legs so forcefully that he dragged me straight onto the floor, then looked down at me, spat a final insult, and stalked off. At that moment, I couldn't help but imagine how my journey would have differed had I been sitting with English friends, speaking English, not wearing a hijab. At these most trying times, what kept me going was the people I was with, Practically, the families who took me in helped me into camps where I lacked the necessary Greek registration document as identification. But far more significantly, it was only the sense of companionship, friendship really, and belonging that firmed my resolve to follow this journey to the end. People often ask me whether I felt scared at any point. Of course I did. I felt scared of the aggressive police, especially in Hungary. I felt scared when in Croatia, my passport was discovered and I was ejected from the camp in the middle of the night and left alone in a muddy field 30 kilometers from any town. And after that, I felt scared at every camp that the same thing might happen again. I never once felt scared of the people I was with. On that train through Hungary, Lying between two blankets that my new Afghan family, who I had met no more than two hours before, had carried from the last camp and now tucked tenderly around me, I felt the most profound sense of protection I have ever experienced. By both groups, I was immediately treated entirely as a member of the family. All food was shared out, a spot on the floor was saved for me to sleep. And when we reached the final camp in Germany, the first accommodation was separate rooms rather than a mass hall. The family insisted on a room for 14, their number counting me. On a train through Macedonia, 13 of us squeezed into a compartment for six. Through my sleep, I felt my head lolling onto my chest and giving me a sore neck, picked up gently, and laid on the shoulder of my new uncle sitting next to me. I visited my second family in their new home in Germany in March 2016. They welcomed me with the warmest hugs and had me to stay for four days of laughter and celebration. In the intervening period since I left them at the final camp in October, we had spoken nearly every day. Despite the lack of a common language, Communication with us and with the first family was nonetheless not impossible. Even as a linguist, I have to admit that much communication is extra-linguistic. 
We share a universal human understanding that serves in the place of words and has allowed me to form a unique but incredibly close friendship with the people in this family. New friends brought together by the most unfortunate and most unlikely of circumstances. If only politicians, the press, and others who shape public opinion and reaction viewed the situation this way, as an opportunity rather than an invasion. Born out of tragedy, a chance to come to know those with whom we have suffered historic misunderstandings. A chance to bring together different cultures and create future hybrid generations that bridge the long-standing gap between East and West. Instead, those with power and influence have abused these positions to spread fear and distrust, deepening that divide and increasing the suffering of people looking only to continue their lives without the fear of an airstrike. Whether with razor wire or with words, the barriers we are putting up between ourselves <coughs> as comfortable Europeans and refugees from the Middle East serve only to our mutual detriment. As distant as the experiences of Canford's oak-panelled dining room and the plastic tents of a refugee camp may seem. Their foundations can be, and are, reconciled in one subject, humankind. And let us not forget that just as ancient wisteria graces Canford with its blooms, Damascus smells of roses. This is an article that I wrote for the old Camfordian magazine back in 2016, a year after I made that journey across Europe. And as Mr. Salmon said, some of you might have heard connections talks that I have given since then. Now, if you'd asked me when I was at Camford what I would be doing in five years' time, I might have said working in the Foreign Office, I might have said studying a master's in Brazil. I certainly would not have said trekking across Europe pretending to be a refugee. It can seem when we're at school that there is a set path laid out for us, that we have to go to university and study a sensible degree and then get a proper job and start climbing the career ladder. And that's great. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I still believe one day I'll be running the Ministry of Education in Brazil. <coughs> but what I've come to realize is that that is not the only option, especially while we are so young. I'm 26, and that might sound old to some of you guys, but trust me, we are, we are young. We have a lot of time ahead of us. And we have so much opportunity. Now, please don't think that I'm giving you an excuse not to work hard. That is absolutely the last thing that I'm saying. I always have and continue to work incredibly hard. The question I'm opening up is what do you want to work for? Having the opportunities and the education that we have all had and that you are all having currently, it is tempting and sometimes expected by our families and social groups to head straight for the most competitive, highest paying jobs that our exclusive education has prepared us for and continue the cycle of generating wealth. And that is understandable. But I think it's important to recognize that our exclusive education has prepared us and put us on the highest platform, not just to be cherry-picked by JP Morgan and Freshfields, but also, whether deserved or not, to be heard and listened to. 
coming from a school like Camford, our voice, like it or not, and it's taken me a long time to get anywhere close to even accepting this, but our voice will be heard louder and clearer than the voice of 90% of the people in this world. And that's what I saw when I made the decision to go on that journey and document it. I didn't like it, but I recognized it. And I put my own discomfort aside to do the best thing I could think of doing with it. So how did it even happen? I graduated from Cambridge and I knew that I wanted to go and work in the humanitarian sector in some, some way helping people and an opportunity arose for me to go to Lesbos um, and, and work there as a volunteer. So I was helping people land, these boats were coming in, you can see in this photo that is one, <coughs> two, three, four, and that's another one, five. We had boats coming in five, six, seven every hour. Each one was made for about 15 people on a small pond and each one had about 70 to 80 people on the sea. A lot of the boats were not making it. And the ones that were, we were, we were helping them to get off, to get on buses down to the capital of the island where they needed to go and register. This is, this is what was left on the beaches. You can see all these black things here are the boats which were burst. That's how flimsy they were. They, they burst when they touched the rocks. And um, just piles and piles of life jackets. These are some people who've just arrived in the town walking up through. And this is the camp that I was working at. This is where people were staying after they arrived. So I met a family, this is actually not the family I ended up travelling with, but this was a gorgeous Afghan family I met at Mitalini Port. Um, and I spent sort of a morning very nervously walking around and sort of introducing myself to families and kind of seeing if, if they would um, they sort of invite me along. And in the end I, I did find a family. And so off we went, got on the ferry spent a day on a bus going up through Greece and we reached here which is uh, this is a town well a place called Edomeni which is the border between Greece and Macedonia or the Republic of North Macedonia if there are any Greeks amongst you um, this this place actually became very very important later on when this border was shut and you might have heard in the papers about tens and tens of thousands of people just getting trapped on the Greek side of it. And um, it basically, a, a town of tents grew up in this, in this field. So I was fortunate that, that we went through just before this happened and we were allowed to pass through. So this is the Macedonian side. These are the, this is the state of the tents inside. It's just rubbish all over the floors. These these are not waterproof tarpaulins, they were soaking wet. It rained the entire time I was travelling. So from there we went um, and crossed the border into Serbia. We were walking along live train tracks in the middle of the night in the driving rain and as you've already heard we ended up having to wade through a river. This was crossing into Croatia. And this, this is not unusual. I actually put plastic bags inside my shoes um, to try and keep my, my feet dry. Now, in Croatia, I actually, this is, this is when, as you've heard from the article, I was separated from my first family and left in, in a muddy field in the middle of the night. And one of the thoughts that occurred to me was, OK, I tried, that's it, it's over. And then there was a little voice that was like, no, hell it's not. Um, and I, I did a lot of research. I actually hitchhiked to the nearest town, spent um, the next day researching 
where people were going from the camp that I hadn't been allowed into and sort of in a very long-winded way with several false starts and dead ends managed to uh, reach the other side of Croatia where I met up with the train um, that, that I would have got on from that camp. And I actually had, this was a very privileged moment because I had quite a while while they were on the train to actually go around talking to people. And obviously in the back of my mind was, oh my God, I've got to find a new family. Um, I'd heard a lot of reports about police brutality in Hungary. Um, so from here we were crossing the border into Hungary. And I had been warned by a lot of people, including one very well-meaning volunteer at this station. And I sort of explained who I was and what I was doing. And I said, you know, I'm just going to, when people get off the train, I'm going to sort of lose myself in the crowd and, and um, cross the border with them. And he took my arm. He was like, please, please, please do not do that. These police are fascist, they hate refugees, and they are so angry that they just have to let them through and they can't do anything to them. They will take any excuse for a fight. They are armed and they are not afraid to use it. So with those words ringing in my ear, um, I crossed into Hungary uh, through another muddy field and ended up face down in the mud. Um, twice actually, which made for a rather wet and uncomfortable next few hours. This is when I got on the train um, <coughs> that, that that article centred on, um, which remains to this day one of the most intense memories I have. Um, this was the, the new Afghan family I met, the various members, and I was terrified. I was sitting there covered in mud, drenched to the skin, and I hadn't slept in about 36 hours. I was shaking with fear because I was convinced that the Hungarian police knew I was on this train and were, were trying to come and get me. And they got their blankets. These, these boys were sitting, as you can see, sort of in the join between the two carriages. And these boys took their blankets out, laid them down for me, and tucked me in. Um, they sort of scooched up on the floor to make more room. And then they started singing to me. I actually discovered later that that song translates as Until my eyes see your face again. So from Hungary we crossed into Austria. This is um, my Afghan family at Vienna station. And having crossed Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, Hungary, Croatia and Hungary, this was the first map we saw. We were never told where we were, where we were going. I only had a vague <coughs> understanding of where we were because I grew up in Europe and have a vague understanding of European geography. And because I had done research on, on where this route went. This was where we stayed in, in Austria. It was a sports hall. Um, and then we got the train um, through Austria to cross the German border. And when we crossed the, the border, there was this really 
So this second family I was traveling with, Germany was, was their destination. They wanted to go to Munich. They had it in their minds. Munich was going to be their new home. And so as we were crossing, there was this joy and sort of air of elation. And as you can see, it wasn't the nicest day, but we were all just so happy, and it was a beautiful, beautiful walk. We had to walk across all of the borders. Um, so this was, I don't know, probably about 10 kilometers. Um, we then did reach this sort of infernal tent where we were held for hours and hours, and a fight broke out. And as I said in the article, I was very scared at every camp that, or every sort of checkpoint that I, wasn't, that I was going to be separated um, and then left on my own again. Lucky that didn't happen. This was the first night we spent in Germany, which anyone with astute eyes might notice is actually a supermarket. You can see the veg shelves over here, the deli counter. So that was, that was an interesting experience. Um, and this was when we finally reached Germany. This is it, the, the end of the journey. Um, the first meal. And the next day, this is, this is where they then stayed um, in a sort of reception center for about a month after that. Um, and this is where I left them the next day. This is actually, you can just see there, the front of the taxi driving me away, which was a heartbreaking experience, um, leaving them there and knowing what I was going back to. So when I came back, sorry, there's a the map. So this is where I started, Lesbos. Went by ferry to Greece, up through Greece, through Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, and then we actually ended up in Dusseldorf. So when I came back, the, the blog that I started to just document my experience, and I was writing it on a phone, I was actually writing everything out in a notebook, and then typing it up on a phone, which is very difficult when you're sort of constantly moving and running on about three hours sleep. Um, I put it out on my Facebook and asked people I knew to sh share it. And I thought, oh, you know, if I put a sensationalist title and a photo of myself in a hijab, I might get 100, 150 clicks. Um, and the day after I published my first post, Two and a half thousand people had read it. So I came back and I had requests for interview, um, requests to give talks. And that's kind of all, how it all started. So I got into activism. I was working uh, for a while as a campaigner for refugee rights. Um, I was asked to collaborate on projects. I was interviewed by the BBC. And I was invited to events as a mentor and consultant on, on the situation. Um, and I was given a blog on the Huffington Post where I wrote about this situation for, for quite a while. And I would love to tell you that that's what I'm still doing. Um, but I actually reached a point where I had allowed myself to get too emotionally invested in the work I was doing. The climate in Europe became more and more hostile. Um, borders were closing, mines were closing, laws were closing, and even big organizations like UNICEF and Save the Children were struggling to have their campaigning voices heard. Um, and I just felt like I was banging my head against the brick wall. Um, and, and so for the sake of my own mental health, I did have to take a step back from, from the intensity with which I was working on this. But it remains, as you can probably tell, a, a subject very, very close to my heart. I'm now founding a restaurant, which may seem a rather strange leap. Uh, so 62 is, is the name of my restaurant. And we are a concept-based restaurant using plant-based fine dining to get people learning and talking about the impacts of animal agriculture on the planet. 
So the name 62 actually comes from a study I read years ago before I even had the idea for this restaurant about, um, about the energy efficiency of food sources. And if you were to take a 10 hectare plot of land and you use that land to grow soybeans, 60 people can live off that land. And if you use the same land to produce beef, two people can live off that land. And that stuck with me and came back, when I had the idea for this restaurant, it came back to me um, as a sort of beautiful embodiment of, of what we're about. So I'll just humour you by showing you some photos of our food, because who doesn't love some good food photos right before lunch? Um, so this actually, if you look at the plate, this is one of the ways that I, I do the sort of informative, educational bit. Uh, so I, I bought a bunch of plates and I turned them into pie charts. So as people eat their food, the information is slowly revealed to them. So it's all about being fun and interactive. Um, some more food. So this is the kind of thing, this doesn't look very nice, I get that. It's very, very important information, doesn't look nice. So I take that and I distill it through the food and turn it into something that looks a lot more like that. Which I personally would, would rather sit down at a table with. So this is one way I did it. I had um, little mini pumpkins as a starter for my Halloween supper club last year. And as people opened them, they, were only a they only had a tiny bit of soup in the bottom. And it was, I'd filled them 20% of their capacity to show that if it was a meat-based soup, you'd get 20% of the content for the same water usage. So it's all about playing with it and, and really getting people uh, to, to see it and then to very literally digest it. They're eating this, this information. And it's about making the experience fun and enjoyable. <coughs> and this is me explaining something, one of, these, one of these funky concepts to people at a supper club. So it might sound like a leap, as I said, but it, I, it is still working um, very much on social impact. And it is based on the same principle of positive activism that I developed while I was working with refugees and doing that campaigning, which is based on, it's based on sharing, it's based on shared experience. And, and the food, in this case, is, is the shared experience. And I can assure you that my studies of especially literature and essay writing and everything that you guys are doing at the moment have really been instrumental in figuring out how to get these messages across, in coming up with these concepts, which think of it like an essay on a plate. That's basically the idea. So that's certainly not the path that I had envisaged taking, even the day that I graduated from Cambridge. But looking back over the last few years, I've certainly done more interesting things, met more interesting people, and grown more as a person by doing what I've done than by sitting in an office in the city. How many of the people who come here and give these talks that you think are cool, or people you look up to as role models, have followed that traditionally prescribed path? There is a social pressure to stay within the mold. I'm not going to lie, there are people who aren't going to like it if you don't. The, the title of this talk actually uh, is, a, is a quote from my father who sent an email to my mother um, after I came back from my journey with refugees. And he said, it is certainly not what I envisaged her doing, having worked so hard at Cambridge for four years. And he also referred to my refugee work in general as my dangerous left-wing agenda. So not everyone's going to like it. And deviating from that path, even questioning that path, can seem terrifying. 
But once you do, and once you find what it really is that you want to do and what fires you up, it is so liberating. And it feels so good. And yes, your family might think you're a bit mad, and they might question what you're doing, or they might say, you know, my, one of my family's favorite phrases was, oh, Morty's going through another phase. Um, but now, they really get it. And my relationship with my family is a lot stronger now than it was when I was trying to stick to the done thing. Um, there was always this kind of feeling like I wasn't quite, they didn't quite get me, um, which was largely because I didn't quite get myself. Um, and now we just all understand each other and they massively respect what I do and what I have done. And we just all get on incredibly well. Um, and even my father came around once I started being invited to speak at prestigious enough establishments. Um, he, he got on board with, with the, the work too. Recently, I was asked to uh, give a talk to people not much older than you, sort of people university age, on the responsibility of wealth. And it was part of a week-long course. And most of their talks had been on sort of investment strategy or, you know, reputation management, things I don't have a huge amount of expertise in. Um, but I was, I was invited along, and it occurred to me that the reason I was asked to speak to people about responsibility was precisely because I had disguised myself as a refugee and essentially smuggled myself across Europe. So responsibility doesn't always look like what you think it's going to, or like what your parents might think it looked like. And please, I accept no liability for what you will choose to do with that. I want to close by taking 30 seconds silence. And I encourage each of you to use it to think about how fortunate you are to be here. The incredible opportunity we have all been blessed with by passing through this beautiful place. Learning from the talented and crucially caring teachers and being nourished and supported by the warmth of this place. I want you to think about the best thing that you could possibly do with this privilege these opportunities. What could you do to serve the world? I warmly invite you to join me in surprising people, in upending their expectations. Don't do what your father envisages, having worked so hard at university. Do more. Thank you very much. The Hungarian police. <laughs> I, I mean, I was, um, for, for want of a better term, suddenly roughed up by them. Um, I was walking through the, the field and I had just <coughs> re-met some, do you remember the photo of the train that I showed you? So there was a lady that I'd met 
kind of through the window, and she was with her daughter and her two brothers. And I'd re-met them sort of off the train, and they'd said, come, you know, come and travel with us. And I was like, OK, this is great. I have, a, I have an amazing new family. And we were walking along, and this policeman just goes, and I mean, I sort of was winded and didn't really know what had happened. Um, and then looked up, and the two brothers had, had gone on ahead, and then the policeman had just very arbitrarily, basically in order to, to split up the family, had stopped. Uh, so my friend and her daughter were left behind, and the two brothers were ahead. And I saw her again at the other end of that train in Austria about nine hours later, and she still hadn't found them. Um, so I was, yeah, I mean, I was sort of winded, and they had batons, and they sort of shoved you roughly, and that, that was the least of it. But yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of very, very nasty stories. Hi. That is a very good question. I... Sorry, the, the question is, why did I want to go into the food industry? I, I approached it from a different angle. I didn't sort of think, I want to go into the food industry. I want to open a restaurant. It was... Um, I started learning uh, about five years ago about all these... Um, the, the relationship, basically, between animal agriculture, eating meat, that kind of thing, and, and the environment and how suppressed, how all of this information was being suppressed um, by sort of financial interest, interests in, in big meat industry, basically. So people like the British Heart Foundation have shares in some of the biggest beef producing um, companies. And I just was so frustrated by it. And I've always loved cooking and hosting. I actually remember being 10 years old <coughs> and I... Um, I was a very bossy child, and I um, insisted on cooking a three-course meal for my family, and I told them to dress up and sit in the dining room. So I've always loved cooking and hosting and getting people together around a table to share food. Um, and my mum's a great cook, and we basically grew up in, in the kitchen. And it just occurred to me, I was sort of at a point where I was recognising I had to step back from, from the refugee work, and I was thinking, what can I do next? And this issue had been something that had been bothering me for a while. Um, and this idea occurred to me of sort of <coughs> combining those two things and like, well, actually, how about teaching people about what food is doing through food? So the idea, I'm, much, I'm a very creative person, so I'm much more the, the sort of creative side than the business pragmatic, I want to go into the food industry side. Um, so it was very much a creative decision and I'm now having to, to sort of pay the administrative and, and business cost of that. Thank you. Um, how did you avoid when you were acting as a refugee um, maybe going into cultural appropriation and offending someone? Thank you. That's an incredibly important question. The question was when I was, when I was on the journey and when I was sort of pretending I always struggle with that terminology for precisely that question. But when I was acting um, sort of as a refugee, how did I avoid committing cultural appropriation and offending people? I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't something that was very well thought out. While I was on Lesbos volunteering, the idea occurred to me, and a few days later I set off and, and set up the blog. I was always honest with the people I was with about who I was. So the, the direct family I was traveling with, I said, you know, I'm English, I'm here because I want to help you. Um, and they understood that and they were, they were fine uh, with it. You know, they, they were very, very welcoming and very grateful for that, which is weird because they were actually helping me more than I was helping them. And... The decision to wear a hijab was um, partly to sort of be respectful of, of the cultures that I was traveling with, and it was also partly to help myself fit in. Uh, I mean, I'm very lucky in that I sort of look quite Arabic or, or Iranian, I often get told anyway. Um, so sort of had I had bright blonde hair and blue eyes, it might have been slightly 
tougher um, journey for me. The name of the blog is problematic. I grant you that. Um, I am a refugee. It was always meant to be polemic. It was always meant to get people's attention. And I don't know, had I call, called it something else, um, I don't know if the response would have been the same. But I felt that very, very strongly. And when I got back to London, the first post that I wrote and shared on the blog was called Why I Am Not a Refugee. And I dealt in that article with every single difference I could think of. Um, you know, I, I went into some of them in the article, but I was basically saying the title of, of this blog was, was to get your attention and get you to, to read it and to pose the question, why couldn't I be? Um, you know, I'm your friend, you grew up with me in primary school, why couldn't I be a refugee? Um, sort of everybody could be is the idea. But yes, you're right, it is there are certainly problematic elements to it, and I'm very, very conscious of that, and I have done my best to address them. Hi. When you said you were on the train and you were worried the police like, knew you were there, is that because you were not, you were like, pretending or acting you were in Exactly. So um, I sort of was nervous anyway because I was in quite a vulnerable position. And then, do you remember, I got separated in Croatia, and I had to cross Croatia on my own, and then I was standing outside of the train for about an hour and a half. They actually kept people on the train for a long, long time, and these people were getting very kind of stressed. Obviously, it was a crammed, crammed, crammed train. And um, so it was very obvious at that point that I was not a, sort of a member of that group. I was not part of that. Um, and, you know, as you saw, I was taking, even taking photos. Only when you know, people were very happy for me to do so. So I was quite obviously not part of that group. Um, and then with all the stories I'd heard about the Hungarian police, um, I created this story in my head that sort of people had been watching me and they knew I wasn't meant to be there. Obviously, in retrospect, that's sort of hugely egocentric and the last thing anyone had time to do was worry about some English girl getting on the train voluntarily. But yes. That, that's why I was scared, is because I had been sort of outside of the group and I was rejoining and I felt quite um, conspicuous. Thank you. The question was, when I was on the journey, was I taking aid that could have been better given to another refugee, a real, I mean, a real refugee, um, and, and how did I avoid that? I sort of stocked up as well as I could before I went. I took a lot of energy bars and dried fruits and nuts and that kind of thing. I, yeah, I, I often didn't take things. There were times when I did have to. Um, obviously, if it looked like it was sort of the last or coming to the end of, of a batch of something, I wouldn't. Um, and at that point, the, the refugee crisis was so, so such a hot topic that a lot of aid was being given. And so having worked in Lesbos and seeing how much stock there was in terms of aid, in terms of food that people were sending, um, all sorts of, of, of products. I obviously didn't take any clothes. You know, there were piles of clothes for people to take. I didn't take any of that. The only thing that I did take um, was, was some food. But um, I suppose in, in a similar way to, to your peers question, there are, there are dilemmas, um, certainly within that journey. And I had to weigh up the sort of the greater good question. Um, sort of if I hadn't eaten, I wouldn't have been able to carry on the journey. And is the impact that me doing that journey had greater than me having eaten an apple that someone else could have eaten? Um, but when it comes down to it, I, I don't think, I genuinely don't think um, that at that point when I was traveling, it was a direct equivalence. It's either mine or it's theirs. 
there wasn't uh, scarcity in the in the aid that was being donated at that time, which sadly there is now. Thank you. A lot of gesticulating and quite a bit of Google Translate. Um, yes, they sort of they had a few words of English, very you know just isolated words. Paper, I remember, was one of them. So I was trying to explain that I didn't have documents, um, and and they understood paper. And then sort of being a linguist with the wonderful instruction of of the language department here. Um, I was able to pick up enough to get by in a very basic way. Anything more complicated than that, we did have to use Google Translate. Um, but I actually ended up, so the second family I traveled with were Afghan. And in Afghanistan, they speak, well, many languages. This family spoke a language called Dari, which is um, a, a variant of Persian. And I picked up enough to actually kind of see that it was a really beautiful language. And I then found. Um, a tutor in, in London when I came back and, and studied Persian for a, a couple of years. Um, so now, now our communication is slightly easier, but at the time it was difficult, but we got by. Oof. I think if I knew that, I would be a lot busier than, than, well, I am busy, but you know, some, somewhere else. Um, I, for me, the answer is always, always starts from compassion. What would you want if this were you or if this were your child? And what is the best way that we can, that we can resolve this, that we can play this? Um, so I remember saying at the time, and certainly writing a lot about um, the sort of insular fortress approach where sort of every, all the EU leaders were going, oh, well, it's not my problem, you deal with it. Oh, okay, no, I don't want it to be my problem, you deal with it. And I just remember thinking, why doesn't everybody sit down together come up with an index of um, sort of an index of, of each country's capacity um, based on a lot of different factors and literally allocate numbers um, based on that. So that's a very superficial um, answer to your question. Obviously, the, the, the way to resolve the crisis is to resolve conflict in the Middle East and other places. Um, and also sort of famine, environmental disaster. So it's, it's, a, it's a big question. Um, the real thing that we need to be thinking is why are people coming in the first place? Um, and that's where we need to start answering, answering the question. Um, but I think that the best way to deal with the symptom of it in terms of people coming over um, is to look at the situation with compassion. Well, thank you for having me.